Pow. And we're live. Okay. Now, have you ever heard someone say they've got the market's timing down to a science? Oh, well, you know, hey, Mike, that's a great question. And I've had people come up to me and say they think they do, or they mm -hmm. show me some new thingamajig that they're, you know, a lot of engineers do this. Well, I've found a better way. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. kind of, but, but I don't know if we can time the market or not. I, I, I think it depends. And so, you know, I know we're going to be batting this back and forth, but I want to let the folks who are joining know that I'm going to introduce you shortly to my buddy, Alex. And Alex thinks he can time the market. Alex keeps getting the snot beat out of him because he gets caught up in whipsaw trying to pick the top and trying to pick the bottom. You have to be always careful if you're going to pick your bottom. But, <laughs> okay. Oh, <geez. laughs> A little bit of humor there. So, hey, if you're out there in, in uh, on any of the uh, uh, YouTube or, or – uh, uh, Twitter, our Facebook, uh, you know, just uh, drop a note. Let us know where you're in from, uh, because towards the end here, Mike and I are gonna, Mike's going to be sharing about some of the psychological issues of, or and mindset issues of, basically being able to time the market. And I'm going to share a couple of super hacks that I've used for years that will help you define more high probability opportunities for timing the market. So Mike, what should we say about timing the market? I think that, well, well, from a personal perspective, I think that that's kind of what you and I are both attempting to do okay. uh, with our entries, right? Because neither of us are entering at random times, just pull up a chart and be like, oh, that one looks good and let, let's uh, plow right into that. So there is a certain element uh, of timing involved. Uh, that said, I would say that neither of us are trying to really predict where price is going. It's more about understanding historical patterns and from there making ourselves available for a potential opportunity. Okay. And knowing yeah. when those things are working and when they're not. You know, that's absolutely true. I, I think that uh, there's a, diff a huge difference between, like you said, predicting, because that's like, you know, like you're thinking about somebody predicting the market uh, is like uh, 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 what a crystal ball kind of thing. Oh, I'm going to predict it's going to go here and here. I, I think that when you define timing the market, if you're looking at specific pieces of the structure mm -hmm. there are things that we've designed into our trading plans that are our rules on when are when to exit when you know when to enter when to exit and it's based on a lot on trends and so waiting for that trend to shift or that momentum to shift and i think that when those are ingredients within a person's trading plan, they can come closer to timing the market or timing the proper entry for high probability trades. But I don't think anyone, I think it is very dangerous if a person tries to pick the absolute top or the absolute bottom. I think that, that and had when you first got traded, started trading, was that one of the temptations you had? was to try to try to do that? No, I, I wouldn't say when I first started, right? Because of, of, of my, when I first started, I just thought you put money in and more money magically pops out the other end uh, given yeah. enough time. So, so maybe there's a certain predictive element uh, baked into that. But um, I, uh, more commonly, uh, the people that I've seen struggle uh, and uh, – Someone that that I was coaching uh, back in, uh, I, I want to say, well, well, when was the original top in uh, in Bitcoin? Uh, that was back, although before, uh, yeah, the the first top 
in 2017. This person came to me uh, at around maybe 2019, uh, and they nearly round tripped uh, their their entire Bitcoin trade. There, there's somebody there that bought in low. They uh, were in the run up there. They thought that Bitcoin was going to the moon. Uh, they as it pulled back and pulled back and pulled back and pulled back. Uh, they said that, well, it, I'm going to continue to hold this until uh, the pain of losing all their profits got to be too great. And then they sold with maybe, I don't know, 20 or 30% gain when they were up a few hundred percent. Wow. Uh, and so that's uh, uh, painful. And so that person came to me and was like, well, what can I do? Is there is this a mindset thing? Uh, like, do I need to meditate and, and these sorts of things? And uh, well, while that could be part of the process and deconstructing some of the beliefs that led to, well, I'm going to hold on to this forever and I know that I'm right, to come up with uh, alternative plans, like mm -hmm. a plan B, in case if you're not right, how do you lock in gains along the way? How do you lock in gains if price starts to move against you a little too much? Because at the end of the day, uh, the, what we're trying to do is raise our equity curve. Exactly. Well, we're not yeah. trying to be "quote unquote" right on the trade itself. Well, we want to be right and be paid. So, if I understand what you're saying, and I and and, and normally I do, is basically what you're saying is that a person can get so locked into trying to time the market that they lose sight of focusing on their process. In other words, it's almost it's almost like they're focused on the outcome. And we all know that winners focus on developing and mastering the process mm -hmm. rather than the outcome of, oh, I picked the top or I picked the bottom. Because I think trying to pick the top and the bottom basically just feeds a person's ego because that way they can go brag to their buddies or brag to their wife or or, or if they miss the bottom or the top, they, their wife's going to slap them. But you know, the thing about it is, is, is it's an ego thing, I think, of trying to pick the top or pick the bottom. Whereas if you're focusing on a process of, of what you're going to buy, stocks or ETFs, and when you're going to exit, a correction, when you're going to enter based on mechanics, when you're going to exit, again, based on mechanics, that it it makes the question of of picking a top or the bottom you're almost irrelevant, don't you think? Yeah, I, I I'd agree with that. If you come in with a process that says, okay, I'm going to enter under X Y Z conditions and then going to exit based on X Y Z conditions, then uh, then it does take uh, picking tops and bottoms uh, out of the equation. That this person, uh, I would say, uh, didn't have, uh, well, certainly didn't have that kind of process in place. But uh, I think that a common problem uh, is also thinking that you have a process and your process is uh, rooted in, I understand this story. And this story is mm -hmm. telling me that price should be 100%, 1,000% higher than what it is right now so yeah, right i'm gonna on. buy and i'm going to hold until my premise proves itself okay right and, and that could be either a, a written process or, or it could be at a totally subconscious level that they're completely unaware of okay cool so hey before we jump much further mike we've got you know some great folks online with us watching us uh, guys, do me a favor, you know, do the ancient trader a favor and just let us know where you're, you're, you're coming in from, you know, just uh, state is fine. Are you from, maybe you're from a state of confusion. And if you are just put down <laughs> confusion uh, down in the, in the chat box, please let us know where you're Not coming in from. I really appreciate that. What'd you say, Mike? Yeah, that, that's where I was from, the state of confusion. Let me know state if of... anybody's back from my hometown. <laughs> And so I know I'm coming to Mike's coming from you coming to you from New York. I'm out here in Makakila, Hawaii. And so we're glad you guys are all here. We've got some other stuff to uh, to get into that uh, 
let's see, Mike. So let's see what, okay. Yeah. Let's banner this around just a little bit. So is focusing just on, like I said, uh, is focusing on events. In other words, a top, a bottom, um, is simply focusing on that and making that the primary focus, is that detrimental to the to a to a trader's uh, you know mental or, or psychological capital? Um, I think it depends on the person. Okay. I think it depends on the person. I think it depends upon uh, where they're at in their trading journey. If somebody is new, let's say, and they're worried about, oh, is this the top? Is this the top? Is this the top? Then they are focused uh, on something that may or may not be. And mm -hmm. their actions are going to be affected by by that um generally in a, a suboptimal way okay uh versus someone that uh, uh, let's say has a few years of experience uh, let's say uh 20 years of experience right that's somebody that's been doing this uh for a very long period of time uh, like yourself uh you come along uh, you see certain certain indicators that are starting to tell you, you know what, uh, we might be close to a top here. I'm starting to see X, Y, Z on the indexes. I'm starting to see uh, certain uh, leading stocks that have been leading the way. They're starting to top out. I'm not seeing too many uh, interesting looking setups. I'm starting to see wide and loose spaces, th those sorts of things. And that could be telling you that perhaps we are close to a top. For someone like yourself, uh, I would imagine that that would start to get you into a defensive posture of possibly even start to look for something on the, the short side. I don't want to put words in your mouth, so please uh, push back. <laughs> um, so No, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, basically, uh, as soon as the, I, you know, I like to use Investor Business Daily, you know, and I, I don't get any kickback from IBD, but I do, I did get their hat. So I'm really excited about having an IBD hat. Anyway, no. <laughs> Um, is is basically I rely on them a lot for letting me know what the broader market's doing. And when they basically went to a stance of a lower exposure rate, mm. I said, aha, that's a good time to reduce my exposure. So how do I do that? I reduce my exposure by simply dropping my 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 number of shares that I buy, like I'll go in with half positions or or two thirds positions, but I reduce it from a full position because ultimately I'm after protecting capital. But you said something really important, and, and I want to really drive this home, Mike. Is you 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 basically said looking for the clues. Well, you didn't say exactly looking for the clues, but that's exactly what the essence of what you said is. The stronger stocks are starting to soften up one, you know, so it looks like we may be getting to a, 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 a level of resistance, strong resistance, where the momentum starting to shift to the downside, those type of things. And so it's collecting these clues and then waiting for the structural break of the uptrend mm -hmm. tells you that, aha, there was a top. And then I think having the plan to how do I want to trade it after I already know there's a top or how do I trade it? Because the same similar clues happen at the bottom. How do I trade it once I know my structure has shifted and and now I can trade back up to the upside because there that's the the direction of least resistance and the highest probability direction. And I think a lot of traders can get themselves in trouble because they don't wait for those, those clues to happen. They try to mm -hmm. make their play along the way. 
And, and so, well, yeah, the stock is going down, but I'm going to buy it here because it can't go much lower. You know, that's an unadulterated BS. I mean, it really is. Because, yeah. you know, I think, you know, if you want to have an experience, go look at the Enron chart. Go study the Enron. And those of you who don't remember Enron, Enron was, uh, you know, a company back, an oil company back in, oil exploration company back in the 2000s. Uh, basically on Forbes magazine, it was identified as one of the top country and top, you know, uh, companies uh, and well worth investing in. That was in 2000, 1999 to 2000, 2001. And then it started to crumble. And you want to see a picture of a technical picture of clues that were put in place on Enron falling is a really good example because it gave clues along the way that the top was in and people could have gotten out and saved themselves a lot of pain. So, so yeah, that, that's what I'm thinking. Hey, uh, Mr. Johnston or Ms. Johnston, B from North Carolina, thanks for your uh, comments uh, saying, follow your system. It will tell you what the market is going to do. Uh, lack of signals, weak patterns, So, yeah, those were those were all kinds of things that, that yeah. were also occurring uh, leading into the COVID top. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, well, we were actually uh, this week, and I sent out a, a note to to, mem uh, to members uh, over in my group uh, on the weekends. So one of the things uh, that I pointed out uh, in in that note uh, was comparing uh, what we we're seeing now versus what we were seeing. Uh, back in in 2020, because people are starting to get a little bit anxious uh, right. at this point. Um, and well, one of the things uh, that was pointed out back then too was that you were moving progressively higher as the number of stocks making new 52-week lows was picking up. Yeah, and, and that uh, that was something that that I've observed over many, many years. It's something that I've actively tracked since my, my days in the New York City IBD meetups. Uh, and the reason why is because whenever the ratio starts to shift, that's where the market starts to get choppy. And sometimes yeah. it causes the market to roll over if it starts to get a little bit too heavy with the new 52-week lows, no 52-week highs. And that's like your, uh, well, well, what's the expression? Canary in the coal mine. Right. And one, one of the things I've noticed is eventually, okay, because right now the, the indexes are being held up with by what, 10, approximately 10 stocks that are doing much better than everything else. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the inertia of the poorly performing stocks will pull down the, you know, it's like the crabs in the bucket. They're going to pull down the ones that are trying to get out. Mm -hmm. They'll pull down. And uh, the the stronger stocks and the fine the stronger stocks after going up, I'm not going to say that they're not going to go up higher, but they eventually the inertia will pull those down. So, Mike, let's get into the segment where you're going to tell us all about how um, how in the world, you know, the trying to pick tops and bottoms or or, or time the market can impact us from a from a uh, mindset standpoint. And I'd like to ask everybody who's online. If you have a market myth that you would like us to talk about in the future, please drop that down in the comment section. Uh, some market myth that you've been bitten by or a market untruth. Because uh, Mike and I, that's what we're here to do. We're here to take on and share the truth about trading. So Mike, take it away. Well, sure. So... Uh, well, when I think of tops and bottoms and how to best navigate the the, the market in general, uh, I actually take quite a bit from uh, one of my mentors. Uh, you guys probably have heard this guy, Mark Minervini. Uh, Dennis uh, and I were talking a little bit about his book, uh, Mindset Secrets for Winning, before hopping on here. One of the things that, that I think that is important and that's helped me 
take my trading to uh, the next level back then and why I'm able to be doing this uh, as my job now is this idea of progressive exposure. Now, what progressive exposure means is that when you're doing well, you start to put more money to work. And when you're not doing well, you start to take more money off the table. Uh, that, that's about as simple as uh, it could be stated. But uh, the idea is that when conditions are good, a bulk of trades will appear. And a bulk of trades will start to work well, right? Because the market ebbs and flows uh, and... Uh, this is how uh, things work. Well, when the market is starting to come off a low, we'll start to see some of the best stocks that could potentially make their moves start to move, uh, right? Your NVIDIA's, your SMCI's, um, your Amber Crombie and Fitch's, right? Uh, uh, all these different uh, types of stocks, I'm sure that you guys watching here and Dennis could rattle off uh, several dozen others. But um, when those stocks start to appear and you start to see uh, those stocks start to take off, then you can take the profits that you made and those are early profits and then recycle them into a new position that's starting to develop or, or a new idea, a new setup that's starting to develop and go in with a little bit more size and a little bit more size and a little bit more size until yep. you're fully invested. And then those, as the tide is lifting, that's how you're able to get into those trades have your risk small, but have larger size. Then when the stocks start to top out, then you start to reduce size aggressively, right? Because if you're starting to see more stocks top out, you're starting to see fewer quality trades, then there's not much to do other than take your profits and wait for the next round. Yeah. So without a doubt, you know, uh, Mike, would somebody just, uh, 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 B. Johnston said, one of the market myths he wants us to bust in the near future is just buy and hold companies with good fundamentals and you'll be fine. And uh, yeah, I mean, you're you're hitting a, a particular nerve for me personally on, on that because, uh, I, I talk about that in, in, in my book, uh, you know, Trade Your Way to Freedom. I talk about the, you know, always ask yourself the question when you're approached by a, by a, a you know, Wall Street professional and they're talking about, you know, you can't, you can't time the market to, you know, just do buy and hold and you be good forever it is to ask yourself a question, who does their advice benefit most them mm -hmm. or me as the investor oh ouch yeah that's that's that that's ripe you know that's ripe and uh so you know you mentioned mark minabini uh uh mike and and i absolutely love you know the way well one mark's complete story rags mm -hmm. to riches uh but how he's reshaped his mindset is just absolutely amazing uh, and he makes a comment in one of his books. He says that success is not convenient. No, it certainly isn't. <laughs> and it really isn't. And and oftentimes, and to check in, what are your expectations? And I think for a person who is you know, trying to do the, you know, pick the tops and pick the bottoms or time the market, um, their expectations may, they be basically false expectations that one, they're smarter than the market, which is mm. always a losing hand. You know that. Uh, that's one. Two is that, um, Oh gosh, what's a, what's a great word? Just I, I covered it a little bit earlier. Just the, the concept of the ego thing coming in there, uh, and then a third is it. It literally is, I think, evidence of a person trading without a plan. They do not have a plan with an edge, because if they're trading a plan with an edge, according to the other famous Mark, Mark. 
Mark, <laughs> Mark Douglas, uh, is that, that he basically says, make your system mechanical and only trade one setup. And if you're waiting for one setup, gets back to what we you know, talked about earlier, is the clues, follow the clues for when the market is turning down and follow the clues when the market is turning up. And, and recognize that we have no control over what the market can do other than two things, when we wanna buy and when we wanna sell. That's the only thing we control. So that's cool. So, anything else there on the uh, on on that aspect of of, of Mike? On yeah, yeah, yeah. You had mentioned something in there about expectations, and you you actually uh, reminded me of a conversation Mark and I had. So, the conversation uh, was about uh, trading championships, and mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, talking to me about how the when uh, he won his first championships, uh, how he was younger in his career, no family yet. And so he's able to dive full hog into uh, trading it and becoming the absolute best. And he achieved that. And so yeah. I said that, well, well, I want to do this, but I've got family and, and all this. Uh, like, uh, so, uh, well, what do you think? And well, uh, here's all, what it takes to be a champion. And you have to, uh, you're blocking out almost all of your time. You're a new okay. father, Mike. Uh, how's that going to work out? Well, hey, you know, uh, the, at one point I learned the hard way that it doesn't work out too well when you're trying to juggle too many major things like this. And just like, well, what, what, what's, it, am I screwed? Right? Like, that's the question that, that I have because uh, here I am. I have uh, these lofty goals uh, of wanting to not only trade uh, full time, but to do so at a championship level and start to, to leave the day job behind and build business. And I also want to be uh, an excellent father and right. to be there for, for my daughter, having especially having grown up uh, with a pretty rough childhood myself. And yeah. so he's like, well, those are pretty competing ideas. Hey, mm. And so I had this, uh, my question was, am I screwed? Right, because uh, I can't, it doesn't seem like I could do you know, both of these things at the same time. And he's like, well, you, it, 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 what you need to do is uh, compartmentalize, right? So, right so have blocks of time where you're just dedicated to trading, lots of time that's going to be family time, lots of time where you're still at your day job, right? Because uh, you can't just shrug that off. Otherwise, uh, you'll get fired and uh, that'll create all sorts of problems. Uh, and so that that was excellent advice. And so yeah. when I did that, that, that's a big part of why I'm here talking to you right now, because uh, I compartmentalized and that helped things at home. It helped me be a better dad, uh, got my trading on track and uh, I didn't get fired. I left on my own accord uh, about <laughs> six years ago. Yeah, without a doubt. And I, I well, I, I thought that the reason you were on on air with me right now is just because you, you, I'm such a good friend. But that's okay. <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, I like to kid around, but no, that idea of compartmentalization, and I'll just kick in on that, is when I was flying, you know, when I was flying jets for the Navy, you know, that they would basically talk about that when you strap on that you know that jet on the back on your back and take off and go on a mission you turn this little switch off and go click things at home don't matter anything that is going on you are folks honed in on that mission per se and they talk about compartmentalization we talk about compartmentalization all the time while flying once back on deck click the switch okay i'm now the husband, the father, and 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 you know the the you know the uh, uh, department head or or whatever the other jobs that I have, uh, but I think that yeah, compartmentalization, the the compartmentalization is a habit that can be developed in a big way simply by but the thing about it, doing it is don't cheat 
your compartmentalization. In other words, if you set aside an hour's worth of time or two hours of time on the weekend to you know, sp- do family time, specifically family time, shut your dadgum phone off, leave, stop checking stock Absolutely. prices, do all that kind of stuff, just cut it out and be present with the ones who love you. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that, 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 that speaks to a big part of quality over quantity time. Yeah, uh, yeah. like uh, there, there's, uh, you know, uh, and I, I'm guilty of this uh, out uh, different points in my life too, where uh, you know you're you're with the family, but then all of a sudden uh, the uh, you're looking at this right, and so your your body might be there, but your mind's not, uh, and that, yeah. that's no good for anybody. That's not good for you. That's not good for those around you. Right on. Right on. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Take this, put it in the other room, and be present. I, I think basically you take this and you put it into a Faraday bag. <laughs> a what? A Faraday bag. It's it's basically a I, bag that will keep the uh, 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 the uh, uh, emissions from this from getting out, but also protect it. I, I encourage everybody to to get yourself a Faraday bag. Uh, just in you know, it, it, it's a good thing to have. Uh, with you because it uh, it makes your phone go dark. Oh, interesting. Uh, I yeah, never it, heard of this. And so, yeah, Can it's yeah, it's to protect against uh, 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 electronic impulses and all that kind of stuff. So, and uh, we, we, they they basically have them where they can basically do a complete screen around a ship or something like that. Uh, but they also have them in compact. Just check it out. Check it out on Amazon and all that kind of stuff. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Appreciate that. And so, well, Mike, I've got a couple of of hacks I would like to share with people. Oh, great. But I need to to basically, these are hacks that I utilize to, that have almost been uncanny on, on um, finding are determining market bottoms in particular. They work, for some reason, they work really well on market bottoms and less less uh, well on market tops. But here we go. I'm going to take a picture of this and I'm going to jump over to, aha, it worked. <laughs> okay. Well, let me blow this up a little bit. What this is, if you've never seen this before, what this is, is this is called the, uh, it's on bar chart. It's a free, free, uh, um, a free chart you can get on bar charts. Um, and what it is, is it's a percentage of stocks above their 20 day moving average. Okay. And when this entity gets down below the 35 level, and I don't know if I can drive, let me see if I can draw, use that to draw a, picture on it. Come on. There we go. Let's see if my, so down here about the 35, and can you can see, can you see that this is 35? The 35 is right here. Yeah. And when, huh? Yep. Yep. That looks good. I can see it. Okay. When it gets below 35, what that tells us is all of the stocks on the NYSE, it, down where it means that 35% of the stocks are at are, are only 35% are above their 35, uh, 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 or 35% of them are above their 20-day moving average, which is basically quite low. When they hit these low spots, as we see here, mm-hmm. here, and here, almost every one of them turns out to be a precise uh, or, or within a couple of days, a, you will find a turning point on the market. So let's just really go in here really quickly and grab these dates. And I really like this. This, this total bottom here is on January 16th of this year. And then what over about over here? We've got the uh, first one is at October 23rd of last year. And then we'll go to the one before that. And we're at it. 
August 18th. And that's all we're going to do is take a real quick look <clears throat> at the other tip on this. And that's your momentum swings also on a weekly chart give you a good idea of Get that correctly. Hold on just a second, guys. That was no October, and that was October 3rd. So we had a couple of the end of October. Let me get my numbers here, and that's at the first part of October, October 3rd. Okay, cool. So over there on the uh, regular chart, why does that? How how does that translate to a bottom? And I'm glad you ask. <laughs> so we'll jump over here. Uh, to my thinkorswim platform. And here is, here's the cues. And I'll just basically roll this back here just a little bit. And also roll this back just a little bit. And let's start with, when was our first date? Our first date was uh, the first part of October 3rd. October 3rd, we had a, and this was October 3rd right here. What, ha what basically transpired was we went into a nice little rally on the queues up to the top and then fell from there. However, what this isolates for us or shows us is a couple of different things. Is one, my momentum shifted. So the 23rd, we grab the 23rd, or this was on, on the first part of October, uh, right there on the 3rd. I had already had a shift of momentum, so that made it that a good buy, you know, place to buy for me. And then it ran it, did a nice little run up of about uh, about. Let's do that one more time. There we go. From there, it does that. Oh darn it, Dennis. We go. Okay, now we can grab it from here. From here up to the top is about a three point and uh, about four percent. So while that, on the Qs that's four percent, but on TQQ that equates to about twelve percent. Nice move. Yeah. I want to go back though to this point. This is ten twenty six, and remember we had a signal on the other at ten twenty three, which was right here. I'll draw in a little box here. And this was actually a healthier signal because my momentum shifted right here on 1030. But look how it corresponds so nicely over here on the weekly chart. And this was the other way to trigger in. Look for your momentum to be slipping down, getting lower, and then it breaks up. That's the clue that, aha. My structure is changing, and I and on the cues, it went on from a nice move from the eight day moving average right there on up to, and I'll try to grab that right there on up, yeah, about a you know 24% run over a very short period of time. If you want more information about how I'm using the eight day and all that type of stuff, you can always look, look for what we do on autopilot trading. The, now, the other one was January. Well, what about January? Let's roll this forward just a little bit. That was right here. There was a couple earlier on around January 1st, but we had a strong signal on January 17th or 16th. That was this day. Note, I have a nice hammer, and it breaks on up with a... Not my momentum shifted up to the upside, but pay attention to a couple of things. Pay attention to what the switch ups on the momentum to the upside. And then that resulted in a nice little pullback and a trade back up to the upside that you could still be in. Or uh, let me see, where is that at? Looking, looking, looking. There we go. So that corresponds to that day right there. And again, clues were saying, hey, get ready to buy me. But that momentum shift, critical in determining 
where to get in. The other hack that I'll provide for you is pay attention to when the, let me get rid of all that, to when the momentum, I use the TSI, the RSI works the same way, when it is down close to the bottom on the weekly charts, oftentimes that will coincide with your bottom where you can basically take a trade to the upside and oftentimes on the weekly chart, as we see here on the, uh, this was the first of last year, that provided an upside move all the way, you know, just continued moving up, continued moving up, slight pullback of about 10% there. And then I'm going to share a secret, Mike, you don't mind if I share this, I hope. Hmm. Not all, you, I love hearing. If you look at TQQQ. Okay. Similar type situation. It breaks above, you know, it basically breaks above the eight week and then holds that. And this run here was 135% over a, a six months, 182 wow. days. And the thing that I love about trading these leverage ETFs is on the index leverage ETFs and also a few of the, the sectors is each one of them has shown since they came, you know, became available back in early 2000s that they will generate about three to five different signals per year and run about 25 or more percent on those signals. And, and if you think about it, that compounds out at better than 100%. So I know we search, spend all our time searching for stocks and searching for, you know, because uh, 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 you know, stocks are sexy and it makes you feel good about finding that big winner. But here's a winner right under your nose. Here's a winner right under your nose. So anyway, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah well, why not just do this? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so... And so, yeah, and why not just do, do that? You know, I think that, that uh, depending on a person's circumstances, you know, having this as a core uh, of, at least for some of their, their capital, mm -hmm. could help them learn how to be a winner. And, uh, and so. Yeah, there's plenty of applications. Uh, that at least uh, that I could see it. And uh, please tell me uh, uh, if uh, what you think about this thought process. Uh, I'd love to hear where, where some some holes are. But if you're able to trade this uh, and have that be the core, uh, and uh, given that the the market is generally going to continue to um, move, and not only not, not just move up, but uh, to be more stable than a stock. Okay. Right? So, so if you're using this uh, as the core of your strategy, then the person that's using this as the core of the strategy could also, if they're looking for stocks, only focus on the best of the best opportunities. Uh, like, so uh, if their bar is here for what they're going willing to take for a stock, they could put their bar up here and not have to worry of, oh, am I going to have enough opportunity because the opportunity is mostly in these ETFs and you're able to compound that that way. Yep. Okay. Does well, that make sense? Or is it... Well, no, I, th I think you're absolutely right. You know, part of the thing in, uh, I think in approaching a situation like this is basically look at, and I think this may be a bonus section of, of, I don't know if it has to, you know, I don't know what it has to do with picking the top or the bottom or, or timing the market. It is related, trust me. But what what you can do is let's say you have, and I'm gonna just pick a number. I, and again, I am not making any advice or, or 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 but I'm just picking a number, giving an example, okay, because we are coaches and teachers and mentors. We are we are not you know paid professionals. Um but let's say a person has $100,000, or better yet, let's, let's break it down. Let's say they've got $10,000 that they want to invest. Mm -hmm. Well, they could take, say, 
six thousand mm-hmm. dollars and and utilize that to invest in the best growth stock okay, okay. and so that basically you want to basically be building a portfolio looking back towards the weekly and the monthly charts for mm-hmm. determining your triggers in and your triggers out okay and, and and basically that and you want that to grow you want that to be continually growing take the other 4000 and say i'm going to be more active with that and i'm going to wait for those 4 to 6 or 3 to 6 opportunities per year because on that i know i'm going to be able to hit let's say conservatively 75 to 100% for the year mm-hmm. think about that and then and then at the end of the year of course let's say you've grown by 40% so that means your 10,000 is now 14,000 you split it up similarly again and you repeat and you repeat and you repeat and within you know I'll let everybody else do the math on on, on what the uh, upside on that is, but it, I, I think it's a really great way to divide up uh, uh, your your dollars. And then when you get up into the millions, then then take that and you know uh, you know take ninety you know ninety percent of that and and be looking at investing. Maybe you want to take ninety percent of that and and invest that into long-term stocks, maybe some bonds, maybe some real estate and all that kind of stuff. And so you grow your wealth that way, but you leave set aside, in that case, let's say you have a million dollars, 10%, 100,000 applied to this ETS strategy and continue to grow. And, And yeah, so the compounding potential and, and the compounding expectation, well, compounding expectation could be quite large. And, uh, mm-hmm. and that's what, that's what we kind of do. <laughs> and so anyway, so, so how are we doing here, Mike? We are, so you want to wrap up? Cause sure. we're at 40, yeah, well, we're we've at, got we're at 47 about, minutes. Uh, a few minutes left. Huh? Yeah. We, we've got a few minutes left. I think. Oh, okay. And so what, well, anyway, so, well, what what was the okay? Let me ask the folks who are online, what has been you you know your aha moment in the discussion that Mike and I have been having so far? And please don't be a ghost. Put it down there. You know, I'm I, you know, I'm the ancient trader. You know, just think of me as like being your your great grandfather or something. You know, stop messing around and put a comment down in the comment section. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. I know I get kind of unruly sometimes. <laughs> and now I was getting ready to, to type something in here. That I I love the the strategy with the triple levered e- ETFs. Um, I, I actually have a, a question about MMTW that that you would. No, uh, we're talking about before while well, we wait for other people in, uh, if I may. Sure. So, uh, so that's focusing the uh, stocks above and below the twenty period moving average on the NYSE. Is that right? What's that? Uh, that MMTW. It's looking at the NYSE. Yeah, the, the NYSE. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, do they have one for the Nasdaq or well, what? Uh, What's your experience with looking at that that's focused on the NYSE? And I noticed that you were looking at the Qs as a uh, Yeah, I think I think they do have one for the Qs. I'd have to go back to barchart.com uh to see if they do. Uh, the you know it it basically and I encourage if 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 a person is going to be taking a look at that, go back piece it together. There's a couple of different ways to look at it. Look at it from both a, with a weekly chart on, on mm-hmm. the uh, 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 percentage of stocks above their 20 day moving average and a daily chart. Mm-hmm. Daily chart, you can go back, I want to say two years, a weekly chart, you can go back five years. And the weekly charts actually will, will smooth out your 
your process a little bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so, okay, TradingView has it. And uh, yeah, Graham says that TradingView also has them all, all the indexes and any time frame. So, um, so I think they do over there on uh, on um, a bar chart. So back to your question is, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely worth a look. Uh, and with what I've discovered over the years is it's it basically is pretty close on all the indexes because the indexes, well, you know, clearly the NASDAQ outpaces the S&P. The low spots tend to tend to be pretty much in line. Mm -hmm. And so, it, it, you know, like I said, it's going to get you in the ballpark of when to, exp and that's when you go and look at the technicals on the actual chart. Mm. Uh, to to basically, what are you looking for? Are you looking for, am I at support? Do I have a reversal candlestick? What's my momentum telling me? And those are kind of the three, you know, three major things that you want to make sure are in alignment and then, and then look to do a trade. Yeah, and there's something that you just said in there that I want to make sure that everybody heard. I, I feel it's important. Uh, the term in the ballpark, right? Like so many... Uh, so many of us want to have an exact level well, when it comes to trading a lot, like, like to the penny layer, like uh, it, that's yeah. not how any of this stuff works. It, yeah. It's so, so much of it is in the ballpark and that's where so much of, I feel the, the art part yes. of trading starts to, to come into play. And that, that's what can really separate your, your champions from, uh, you know, the never bins. Yeah, you know, Mike, that's a great, great example uh, of the art. You know, it's it's the science and the art. I mean, it really is. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, I mean, did you know that on a big stock like Nvidia, that's up over uh, up to close to nine hundred dollars, mm -hmm. if you put a trend line on that on that chart, and you go and make the, the you, you where you can adjust the trend line where it's like three points thick. Mm -hmm. that trend line itself could be, you know, could be $50 in, in thickness. Wow. <laughs> okay. okay. And so part of the thing, uh, hey, Ben, thank you very much, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, make sure you watch the recording. It's going to be up on Mike's YouTube channel and my YouTube channel. And so uh, uh, what I was going to say is when you recognize that support resistance and also dynamic support and resistance, if you don't know what that is, let me know. We can, we can, I can tell you what that is, is in reality a zone. It's a zone of values. And I think that's one of the reasons why Bill O'Neill says that, you know, if you're within, what, 3%, 3 5% 5 of your trigger, that, that you're still okay to enter. Because mm -hmm. he recognizes that resistance zones and support zones are, are just that. They're zones where, 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 you know, people are going to act or react. Very seldom are they to the penny. And one of the hacks that you can learn in trading is let's say you've got a, a, a you know, let's say a moving average line is at, let's say, $56.04. Fudge. Learn to, you know, you want to trade off of that moving average, fudge it up. Fudge up, you know, it's going to, you're expecting it to come down to a bounce. Fudge it up to 56.10. Or fifty six fifteen, or fudge it up to where the where the moving average is going to be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. and, and, and huh? Yeah, that, yeah, that's a great one. I, that that's one that I actually use myself. Yeah, but to where it's going to be tomorrow, and then if you want to have some fun, just observe what can happen in a in a in a six seven and a half hour trading day to the moving averages. 
like it can start out, you know, just high as a kite, but by the end of the day, that's why I think the most valuable time to watch the market is the last hour. Yeah, absolutely. Because I can literally make trading decisions. The candlesticks are closer to being actually complete, mm -hmm. which they paint a big, huge story. And then, and then I can design my trade at either at the end of the day or after the, after the market is closed. But uh, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like one of those, all the noise in the morning, you know, I'm, I'm in a, Hawaii. The market now is open at 3.30 in the morning. Guess what? I, you know, and trust me, you're, you know, look at me. I need my beauty sleep. You know <laughs> that, guys. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> so that's what we got going on here. And so, yeah, Ben. What I use, Ben asked a question of what I use for a for right for a stop loss and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I look depending on where I make my you know plan my entry. Typically, my stops are based on either swing lows or moving averages. If we break below those, and normally my stop losses initially are somewhere about four and a half, you know, four and a half to three and a half percent. My catastrophic stop loss is between five and six percent. And so that's kind of my, you know, that's what I utilize. And then once the trade starts going in my direction and I start hitting some of my profit targets, I will then trail a stop of somewhere between seven and a half and 10 percent up until I hit 20 percent profit. At 20 percent profit, that could be a big winning stock or winning ETF. I'll move my trailing stop to 12 and a half percent then. Because typically, if you go and look at now, look at NVDA uh, on its big moves up here recently, it has not had a pullback of greater than 10%, greater than 10%. So 12 and a half percent is my 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 safety check but thanks for that question appreciate it so mike there's one thing we always want to remind people though you know both of us you know uh, have a strong belief in god we mm -hmm. think that he has put us here with a purpose and part of the purpose is to help people one understand how to trade because we both believe that that uh, that 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 money, we both believe that money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is, but that that God has put us here to multiply and to be productive, and that's exactly what both of us are supporting in this. And and uh, should we share what the people? You know, we have an objective for the year, right? To reach a hundred thousand people. No, uh, that's right. And to not only reach 100,000 people, but to help 100,000 people have a, a five-star trading year. Now, that's going right to be on. a bit different depending upon who you are, right? If you're somebody that's just starting out, then maybe you, you're uh, starting to gain some real confidence uh, in what yeah. you're doing. You trust yourself. You, you, you're not stressed about pulling the trigger on a trade. If you're a bit further on your journey, maybe your a five-star year is uh, beating the market. Yeah, maybe you're... Uh, the two xing uh, the the S and P or the Nasdaq. If you're uh, somebody else, might be looking to win a championship or yeah. starting their own uh, uh, their own fund, yeah. managing other people's money. It could be a variety of things. And so, yeah, and kind of my idea on on that. If it, I'm thinking, if you know, if we can be the guides to help people be the hero of their own stories. Yes. Uh, then, then, you know, a five star year for them may be just to get rid of all the, 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 the false expectations they have about trading, and to replace mm -hmm. them with true, uh, 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 solid, positive expectations about what they can do. Because I wrote in my journal the other day. And I want to share this with everybody. 
It's never too late to become the person you want to be. Never. It's never too late to become the trader you want to be. And so, anyway, well, we're at the end of our hour, man. Wow, flew, time flew by. It always does. <laughs> man, this has been awesome, Dennis. I've got uh, a page of notes here uh, just from listening to you speak. Uh, and uh, I mentioned it last time. I'll mention it again. Uh, I selfishly uh, love doing this podcast with you for that reason, for, for how much uh, I learned from you. So thank you. Well, I want to, again, thank you also, Mike, because I, I get the same from, you know, from you. And the thing that I that really is crazy is I have always found it valuable in my life to be mentored and, by younger guys. Really? Yes. You know why? Is, no because, is because one, they have new fresh ideas that okay. in turn keeps my ideas fresh and new. And so, and so, so I don't get set in my ways. You know what I'm saying? And so Graham gave us a really good verse. He says, uh, he says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Jeremiah 33, 3. That's, that's God's phone number, you know, Jeremiah 33, 3. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, so, hey, Mike, we're going to end the stream now, guys. Thank you so much. Drop a comment in the uh, on either Mike's YouTube page or mine or in on X uh, or on Facebook. And let us know what are the myths that we can take on. Mike, please hold on. Aloha. God bless everybody. All right.